I was down with the no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. Welcome. My name is Minister Richard Foreman. Yes, and I'm Vicki Foreman, his wife. And we, like, we would like to welcome you to our worship service. And get ready, get ready, because Pastor D is going to be preaching our excellent word, and it will change your life. So get ready. And before we get started, let's go to the throne of grace. Let us bow. Most gracious and loving Father, we come before you today giving you glory and honor. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to fellowship. We ask that you bless the man of God. And Lord, we pray that someone's life will be changed through the preached word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now get ready. The praise team is coming to sing. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise. Thank you, Jesus.
so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and the sea came into peace, because he said, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no fear? They feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? One of the reasons we love movies is because movies tell stories. And we all love stories. A good movie tells a good story. A great movie tells a great story. And the movies can actually explore all the different ways to make sure that the story comes alive. Uh, there are several types of, of stories that movies tell that makes them exciting. The first one is narration. You've seen the movie where the central character uh, is narrating the ups and downs, the particular things that are going to happen. There's a scene that they explain through narration just to bring the movie to life. A great movie for this is Kill Bill with Uma Thurman. Great movie. Or another thing is the opening action scene. Uh, all of the James Bond movies start like this. It's where the hero is in this predicament that looks impossible to get out of, and yet somehow you're caught from the beginning in that movie because the hero makes it through. The other kind of movie is a biography. It's really great because the biography starts out with the small beginnings, the humble beginnings of a person, and it tells how they rose to be the person we know in history that is famous. Um, Spike Lee's movie, Malcolm X, which, by the way, should have won an Oscar. That movie was exciting with Denzel Washington and Angela Bassett and and it was just a great movie about the life of Malcolm. He really played the part through the biography. Another type, which is one of my favorite, is the revenge movie. That's the one, I know you say, uh, preacher, believer, pastor, come on, you should not like revenge. It's only a movie. Come on, get over it. What I'm saying to you is I love revenge movies because in those movies, justice happens because the hero or someone suffers a terrible, horrific injustice, and then somehow through the movie, they get their revenge. They, they get back, and things seem to go back in balance. Well, I'm talking about movies because I chose to approach this text differently, homiletically, than I do other texts. I'm actually going to start from the back of the text, and I'm going to use a movie uh, a movie technique for telling a story, we're going to look at the flashback. You know what a flashback is, right? The movie opens up and there's a scene that you don't understand, and then after seeing it, there is a sign that goes across the screen that says uh, two weeks ago or six months ago or whatever, but it tells you, then it goes back and starts the movie there to bring you up to where things are happening. I'm going to do that with this text today. I'm gonna to start at the bottom of the text, at the, at the back of the text, and we're gonna flash back to get some principles and see some things that God wants to teach us through this text. So let's do that, let's dive in. So this, this, this uh, let's go to verse 37, around there. It's the part we all know about. You know, they were on the Sea of Galilee, and a big storm arose when the disciples were there. And I want you to see the scene that's happening. The wind is howling and, and blowing recklessly. And it's so much so to the disciples are running around and they're trying to make the trying to make sure the boat doesn't tip over and they're 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 yelling at the top of their lungs at one another, and rain blows and wind flashes and the boat almost tips, and all of a sudden one of them yells, um, I don't think we're gonna make it. And then the wind pushes him, and another one yells, this boat is not going to hold. <sighs> Hear the wind blowing and flashing all over. And another one says, what is he doing? Talking about Jesus. 
This was a storm. If you can get the picture, and the boat that the disciples were in, there were marked fishermen, but the boat that they were in, this boat was being driven all over the sea. And as they were being pushed around the sea in this boat, spinning, they had no control. It was a scene where they were facing one of the fiercest parts of nature, an out-of-control storm. It's like nature was mad. And all of a sudden, the wind blew down, and they were on the Sea of Galilee. And you need to understand why this storm was so vicious. Because the Sea of Galilee always had, they had good fishing, but they also had big storms. And on the Sea of Galilee, you got to understand, it was a sea that was about 13 miles long in width. And about 27 miles long the other way. And it had mountains all around it. Mountains on the left, mountains on the right. It was down like in a valley. The Sea of Galilee was a freshwater sea, but it had one of the deepest depths below sea level, which made it really dangerous. It was 682 feet below sea level. So when the wind came down through those mountains, it was like they were in a vacuum, and it would suck you up and blow you all over. And this night, the disciples found themselves caught in this storm, and Jesus was in the bottom of the boat, sleeping, and all of a sudden they couldn't take it anymore. Another wind hit, and the boat tipped, and all of a sudden one of the disciples says, go get him now! He's got to come help us! And they go to the cabin, because each one of these ships had a mast, and they had a little cabin-like place down underneath, and all of a sudden you see a figure of a man rise up. After they were knocking and screaming, help! Master, help! We don't care! We're going to die! And the figure steps out, steps to the top of the boat, puts his hand out, and utters the word, peace, be still. And the disciples look in amazement as they're all standing there. All of a sudden, the wind runs away, and the rain goes back up. And the sea levels down like a fresh made bed. And all of a sudden everything's calm and you can hear again. And peace came instantly at the voice of a sovereign God. And there's a cheer from the disciples. Yay! But then the man turns around. Their teacher. Their master. And they can see when they see his face. It's not one of jubilation. In his face, is, it looks puzzled. And then something happens that is the title of this message. He asked them two questions. That's what we're going to talk about, two questions. Two questions that they were not expecting to be asked. Two questions that set this situation in perspective. This teacher, this master, turned around and you could tell the look on his face. He was, if not disappointed, he was definitely hurt. And he looked at them. And the teacher asked two questions, which I'm putting forth to you. He looked at them and said, why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? Did you hear it? Devastating, let honest questions. Why, after all the time you've been with me, I was on the ship, I was here, I've never let you down. Why are you so fearful? And how is it that with all I've carried you through, you better hear me, you have no Faith. Oh, there are two questions. I never want God to ask me. And the name of this message is two questions. You never want God to ask you. Look at the nature of the questions. Faith and fear. Two opposite forces. Faith, a divine force. And fear, a demonic force. Faith and fear. Two forces that are completely opposite, that cancel each other out. If you have faith, then your fear must take its place underneath the feet of faith. But if you have fear, fear can override your faith. They can never stay in the same place. And yet Jesus 
Jesus said, because we are born again, we ought to be able to handle our fears. We ought to be able to put fear under our feet. We belong to a God who knows what we're going through and knows the battles that we have seen. And yet this night, this day, God asked them a question. Now don't get puzzled why we have to teach this text is because all of us experience fear. I don't care if you have somebody sitting there telling you how holy they are. There's not one of God's children who has not found themselves fighting off fear, fighting off anxiety, fighting off this stress that comes through. Can I get an honest person? And most of the time, it is God's saints who have to deal with this. If you're not saved, the devil doesn't want you. But if you're a believer in God, that's when you have to be careful. He wants fear to rob you of your faith. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he was mentoring and tutoring Timothy, who he knew was timid, and Timothy had to be now become the bishop of Ephesus, he told Timothy, he said, you got to get ready for got to get ready for this. So in 2 Timothy verse 1, chapter 1, verse 7, he said these words. You know the words. But God, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Somebody wake up. You're walking around with a fear that God didn't give you. As a matter of fact, this text says not only did God not give us this fear, it's letting us know that because God didn't give it, we're not supposed to let it ruin our life. We're supposed to fight that fear by our faith. That's what he was telling these disciples. You can't run around in fear when you're supposed to have faith. He says, as a matter of fact, we overcome fear when we got saved. It says we have power. That's his power and the power he gave us. So we overcome fear by his power and our power. We overcome fear by love, his love for us and our love for him. We overcome because I'm telling everybody out there, you have a sound mind. Fear can come in and destroy your mind. What God was really asking these disciples when he said, why are you so fearful? What he meant to say, but what he was literally saying to us biblically is, why don't you have peace? Where's your peace? With all the times you've been in dark places and you know I'm going to get you out, how come you don't have any peace? As a matter of fact, peace is your right. Peace is our overflow of the spirit that's in us. Somebody better hear that. The fruit of the spirit. Fruit comes from a harvest. Harvest comes from the seeds that we plant. The fruit of the spirit brings us peace. Galatians 5, 22, 23 says these words, uh, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. There's no demonic force. There's nothing that can stop me from having the fruit of the spirit. Where's the fruit in your life? How come you're walking around allowing the enemy to take back something that God said is a part of his gift to us? Peace is supposed to be is supposedly something that we can grab and access at any time. How do I know? Because John 14, verse 27, the Gospel of John, Jesus, before he was leaving, he said these words to us. He said, peace I give unto you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world give it, give I unto you. Let not, what's the word let? Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's letting me know I got something to do with whether or not I lay around in anxiety or I lay around in peace. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. God said we are born to have peace. We have a threefold peace according to this text. Watch this. We have peace with God. That is the peace of salvation. He's no longer angry with us. 
We, we have a peaceful life because we're on our way to heaven. At one time, we were enemies of God, but now we have peace. We aren't quarreling anymore. I'm, I belong to him. We have the peace with God. We have peace of God. That's what Jesus just said. My peace I leave with you. He said, I'm giving you peace. So inside my body is some peace of God that should take over if I concentrate on him. Come on, stay with me. And we have the peace from God. When we read his word, it is meant to bring us peace. But the second question was even harder than the first question. Because that question, how is it that you have no faith? That relates to what you believe God is capable of doing. When you don't have faith, it's not an indictment against you all the time. It's an indictment against you not knowing what God can do. And Jesus said, faith. It's superior, it's the premier, it's the foundation. Do you realize everything that we do happens by faith? Everything we get from God comes from faith. Saved by faith, delivered by faith, healed by faith, uh, given peace by faith. If God says it, we need to understand that faith, root, our inheritance comes through faith. There's nothing you can do or nothing you can get from God except by faith. That's why Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter, sometimes called the hall of faith, is so powerful because it's a museum. It's a, it's a place we can go and visit and look at those who are on display, all of the men and women, the patriarchs who God used in every dispensation are standing there telling them, telling us, I was nothing, but it was my faith that got me where I am. And that faith raised them up. And now they're living examples. As a matter of fact, the sixth verse of Hebrews chapter 11 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Somebody said, Pastor, that's not fair. How can God, how come I just can't come to him as I am? It is fair. Because Romans 12 and 3, Paul was talking to the church at Rome about faith. And he said to them, uh, for I say unto you, by the power given unto me, that each man ought to not think of himself more highly than he ought to, but he ought to think of himself soberly, as it is written or according to the fact that God has given, you better watch this, each man the measure of faith. You know what the measure of faith means? That nothing that happened to me, the faith was always in the hip or shot put. The faith you need this morning is available right now to you. You just got to grab it. God said, I already gave you the measure. I measured that in. I measured your sickness in. I measured your trials in. It's already yours. That is why this text this morning, we're going to talk about very quickly two questions. We're going to do it in a flashback manner. We just went there. Now we're going to flash back and we're going to pick out four points that explains what these disciples did to get to the point that the Savior had to ask them after all he did for them. Why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? I hope. I hope if you're sitting there in doubt or in a fall that you hear God asking you that question. Why are you so fearful? I've been protecting you. I brought you this far. How is it that you have no faith? Here's what we're going to talk about. The disciples did not understand their status. First way you're going to make sure God doesn't ask you no questions is understand your status. The disciples did not understand the power of suffering. You must understand the power that happens when we suffer and stand. And the disciples did not understand as they were going through how to handle it when God is silent. I can't hear you, God. Say something. And lastly, disciples did not understand they were safe in Christ. Watch this. You got to understand your status. You got to understand the 
power of suffering. You got to understand how to act when God is silent, and you have to know you're saved in Christ. Mark's gospel, this fourth chapter, is a gospel that reinforces kingdom principles, and it takes us to a place where God uh, shows us that the kingdom principles are the same out, all, all throughout Scripture. Uh, what I'm saying is, in Matthew's Gospel, you have the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke's Gospel, you have the Sermon on the Plain. And they talk about principles that Mark talks about in this fourth chapter. I need you to know that God never varies or no word contradicts God. His word always says the same thing. You just have to understand it. So in this fourth chapter, he goes through a litany of things that he talked about in Matthew 5 and in Luke's Gospel. Here's what he says. First, he starts off with the sower and the seed. But it says he started talking to them in parables. Parables, an earthly story explaining a heavenly principle. He started talking to them. So the first thing he said was a sower sowed seed. The seed is the word. It comes back 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. He explained how we plant our seed and our blessings come as we watch our increase. Then he talks about let your light shine. Just like he did in the, in the other Gospels. He said, he gave the analogy of a candlestick. He said a candlestick candle is not lit to be hid under a bushel, neither are you. Let your light shine. He left that and gave him a parable about it is measured, uh, about how you measure stuff. Said how you give, it comes back to you. That is a principle, a divine principle God keeps showing us. Whatever I give, it comes back to me. Here's what God is saying. As you give, you give a little, you're going to get a little. You give a lot, you're going to get a lot. But you are the one that decides the measure. I wish I had time. You're the one that decides the measure of your blessing. By how you give. Jesus leaves that. Then he talks about the power of God's word as the seed that grows on its own. He said heaven is like a man who lays down, plants a seed, gets up, lays down, gets up. And the seed starts growing as long as he's making sure he's nurturing the seed. It will grow by itself. First the corn, then the ear, then the full ear in the corn. It talks about that will happen. And then lastly, he says a mustard seed of faith. I like that one. If you have a mustard seed, everybody know that? You don't have to have a lot of faith. The devil's been lying to you. You just have to have a mustard seed full of faith and everything else. Mountains will move if you have a mustard seed. The tiniest seed there is, but it will grow bigger than anything else. Faith is that mustard seed. And then he's tired. Jesus has been teaching all day, and now he gets to his disciples. He said, let us go to the other side. Jesus said, let us go to the other side. When Jesus says, we're going to the other side, that's it, period. We're going to the other side. Jesus told the disciples, we're going to the other side, and no matter what obstacles they hit before they got to the other side, they ought to know if Jesus said it, that settles it. I'm talking to somebody. If Jesus said it in his word and you grab that promise, then you ought to know that promise is settled. I don't care if storms come. I don't care if all hell breaks out. I don't care if it looks bad. I don't care if your situation looks bad. You ought to realize if God said he's a healer, then claim your healing. If God said he's a provider, then let him provide for you. Don't sit there vacillating back and forth. If God said he can turn situations around, let him turn your situation around. If God said that uh, no weapon formed against us shall prosper, believe God's word. That's our problem. The disciples forgot their status. How come we can believe it when God said it? Because status is defined as our standing, our position, our rank, who we are, whose we are. You ought to know that our lives, your life as a believer, we're standing on the finished work of Christ. Did somebody get that? Nothing can defeat the finished work of Christ. That's what I stand on. I don't stand on my merit. I don't stand on what I did. I stand on the fact that Jesus paid it all. My status is I'm always a winner. We're the head and not the tail. We're above and not beneath. We are more than conquerors. You forgot. It's not you. It's your status. 
You are a child of God. You're a royal priesthood. You're in God's family. Quit running around like this tragedy just happened can stop you from being who you are. You cannot stop me from being a king's kid once I've been born again as a king's kid. Somebody ought to shake themselves right now and start remembering who you are. But whatever your status is, that's the blessing that you can get. Like Some of us forget that we need to know that God said, as a believer, there's nothing that can stop you from being in my will. Our position going into a situation, our status is always greater than our situation. Well, I like that. Somebody say that. My status is greater than my situation. Once your faith raises your status, you are greater than the problem you're in. Can I say that again? Once your faith raises your status and you start remembering who you are, you are greater than the situation that you are in. As a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians, uh, the verses 2.14 says, Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. All over, I don't care where you are, I don't care if you're riding down the road, you ought to tell yourself, I'm a winner. Don't look like you're winning, but your status is greater than your situation. I'm a winner! Because God said I'm a winner. How do you think the woman with the issue of blood broke all tradition, didn't care how much she was bleeding, didn't care who saw her. Her faith told her, if I can touch his garment, I'm going to be made whole. She raised up her faith, and her faith raised up her status. And so when she got to Jesus, she could draw on his power, because she was drawing on it not as a person who was weak, but as a person who could stand. Just this past week, I talked to two believers who had coronavirus. Both of them had severe cases. Lungs were affected. Couldn't breathe. Throwing up. Had a, lost their sense of smell. Then there was another foul smell from the virus in their body. They had body aches and cramps. They could barely move. They had been to ventilators. And yet, when I talked to them, I couldn't have gotten two, diff two different stories because both of them recovered. But watch this. The first believer I talked to still looked defeated because he said, it was horrible, man. I knew I was going to die. It felt like I was this close to death. I wouldn't wish this on nobody. Oh. Now he was, he, he, he was recovering and still talking like that. The second believer, as we were talking, he wasn't saying anything about death, but he was telling me the same symptoms. But I said, well, weren't you afraid you were going to die? He was almost insulted. He said, I was never afraid I was going to die. You must don't know who I belong to. God's in control of my life, not this virus. He said, when some doom will come in my mind, I start thinking about my Savior, and all of a sudden, I turn over to God. I knew I was going to be all right. Two people, same condition. Which one do you think had the best journey? The one who remembered their status, your position. Can I tell you, I don't care how low down you get. Think about your child. Your child is still your child. All they need is a good dusting off. And some faith internally, and you know you'll let them come back home. God does the same thing. Your status is, you're my child. I won't give up on you. Don't you give up on me. Then the suffering. The Bible said a storm came. You know the text, I think that's verse 36. Yeah, a storm came after the multitude came, verse 37. Um, they not only forgot their status, they forgot that suffering produces power. Uh, Suffering lets us know that God is still working in our life. Pain, and we overcome it, takes us to a position we've never been in. You know, the Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by our testimony. Suffering gives you a test. Oh, I'm talking. Do you know right now, oh, if I could talk to some people, there are some testimonies. You didn't like what you went through, but now... You're walking around when the enemy comes at you. What used to shake your tree don't shake you no more because of the suffering you did and you went in with your eyes open. You said, I've been there, done that, seen that. Devil, try something else. That's not going to work this time. 
Because that's the person who grips suffering. The disciples thought suffering was God didn't care about me. As soon as you start thinking suffering is a punishment, you're going to miss out on the blessings of the power of suffering. I already said that you can go through suffering one or two ways. You can either be an egg or a potato. That's right. Here's what happens. When a potato is placed in boiling hot water, it goes in hard but comes out pliable, tender, soft. An egg goes in soft and comes out hard. I've seen saints suffer, miss their blessing, thinking God's not there when they didn't realize that they would have relaxed and joined into the suffering. God could have taken them to a new place. Why do you think James says count it all joy? Because suffering produces a power of permanence in us that comes through patience. I'll say that again. The power of permanence comes to patience. It means once I build up the muscle to handle that, it can't get me again. But you got to understand the suffering and be willing to go through it. it. It says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing that the trying of your faith work patience. Let first patience have its perfect work so you can be perfect and entire. You will be empowered. I like what he says. Count it joy. I need somebody this morning that's suffering to say, I'm going to count it joy and let the suffering go to work in me. Not only does suffering produce in us a powerful person, suffering makes us obedient to the word of God. Psalms 119 and 71. You know, uh, David said, 119 said, it is good I was afflicted because now I'm obedient to your word. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? But here's what David was saying. That suffering taught me to be obedient and obedience brings the promise. Suffering taught me I need God. God hollers louder in my suffering than he does in my happiness. Because in suffering, I can hear him, I can see him, and he takes me higher. When I was looking at the commentaries, there is no occasion for Psalms 119. Because all of us have to go through suffering, and we can learn from suffering to get to a place of power. I'm reminded of one of my classmates who was a believer. It was a female who said, Will you please marry me, perform the wedding ceremony to this gentleman? But she did not want to go through counseling. She had just met the guy. And I said, no, I was called all kinds of names because I would not marry her to a guy she only knew for about four months. She got upset with me. But you know what happened? She found somebody else to marry. And when she got married, not long after that, the suffering started. First, verbal assaults. Start calling her out of her name. Then after that, physical violence. She suffered in that marriage for almost five years, running away, him chasing her, hunting her down, police restraining orders, all kinds of things. Then she finally got out of that marriage. She is remarried to another man who is a believer. And you know what? She married the other guy because he said, it's better to marry than to burn. I want, I, want, I want to have sex, I can't wait. You know what she said? She told this guy, we gonna wait. And you know what? They got married, they have two beautiful children, and she said, I learned how to trust God's word. Listen, somebody out there said, well, you know, sex feel good, but suffering don't. God's word is designed to take us to a place where blessings can come to us. And she learned. Well, I can tell you about the brother who got mad at another guy on his job. And as they were working together, they got into this beef. And it got so bad that he went around telling people stories on this guy. Finally, it got so bad that the guy had to quit the job. He left. Two years later. What's really funny is, before the guy left, he came to apologize to my friend to try to settle the beef. And he said, no, nah, I don't accept your apology. He was bitter. Well, two years later, he got married. 
was going to buy a house. All the paperwork was in, everything looked good. He passed through all the tests at the bank, but he had to get the loan officer to sign off. Guess who the loan officer was? The same guy. He wouldn't accept his apology and who he was bitter against. And immediately, when he saw this guy, because he wanted that house and he knew he needed his family to have the house, he said, look, I am sorry. He repented. He told the guy, look, I know I did you wrong. I'm sorry you had to leave the job. He did all that, and the guy finally stopped him. He said, you know what? I was going to sign your loan papers anyway. I'm glad you did repent, because that's all I wanted us to do. But I needed you to know I follow the word of God. My friend, his brother, cried. Because here he was letting bitterness. And God's word said, don't let bitterness come. We think God's word is there to hurt us. Everything in God's word, the suffering we go through, is to teach us to trust his word. So that's why you shouldn't talk about folk. God's word said, don't do that. Don't gossip. The same thing you talk about might come on you. Here you go. You go suffering. It comes back on you. Every time you lift your voice to down somebody else or to curse somebody else, all you're doing is cursing yourself. Better that you tie a stone around your neck and jump off a bridge than you to talk about your brother. But we think the word is just this priest up. I just want the word so I can get this, get that. God said, no. Suffering brings power. And then finally, he said, silence. Jesus was asleep in the hindered part of the ship. I know they start running around. How come I don't hear from God? All of a sudden, one of them just screamed out. You got to go get him now. Here's what they said to God. Listen to the word. Listen how hurtful. Don't you care that we perish? Wait a minute. I know Jesus was saying, you wouldn't have made it this far if I didn't care. How do you think you didn't go under? Because I care. Matter of fact, you got more evidence that says I care than to the contrary. How can one storm make you think that I don't care? Silence. Is God giving us a chance to be built up? Silence never means he doesn't care. Silence means we're growing or he's doing something. Matter of fact, silence, when God is silent, quit going right that he don't care. What you ought to do, let me give you a couple things quick so I can close this message. The first thing you ought to do is check or inspect your own life. See if there's any sin separating you from God. We're so quick to start hollering, God, why don't you show up? But we forget a whole lot of sins. I know people, they can get nasty with folk. Sickness will come in their life, and they never connect the sickness with how nasty they are. They never connect the sickness with how mean they are. But they can sure holler, God, God, I need you. No, God says, when sin is in your camp, it separates you from me. What am I talking about? Remember when they, when the children of Israel defeated Jericho, the largest obstacle in the desert, walls came down by a shout. Then they went to attack little old Ai, and they fell and had to run. Same people, but Achan had taken of the accursed thing. Some of us have brought cursed things into our heart and wonder why God's not speaking. God said, you can't have idols and me. Oh, I know this is hard. Stay with me. Examine yourself. And then keep talking to God. You know one of the things that burn me up more than anything else as a pastor? Folks will come to me. I'm one person. I can have five, six hundred people in the congregation. They'll come to me and say, I'm mad at you. You didn't call me when I was sick. Now, I know you know what I want to tell them. Because we all thought it. The phone works both ways. Why didn't you pick it up and call me? Now, I can't say that because then I'll be a mean old pastor. But that's sort of what I'm thinking. I know God be thinking that. You're mad at me because I'm solid. I don't see you calling on me. I don't see you praising me. I don't see you going off anywhere worshiping me. Maybe if you kept talking to me, I showed up sooner because God said I inhabit the praises of my people. So God said, not only are you to just keep talking to God. He said, and then finally understand, I'm telling you to do when God is silent. 
He's sovereign. Watch this. But he's also good. Oh, that's so good. God is sovereign. He can do what he wants, when he wants to, but he's also good. He's a good guy. He's the goodest guy. He's good and good. So that means even though he's silent, I know he's doing something good. So here we are. Flashback. We saw three things we shouldn't do. First, we got to understand our status. We got to understand the power of suffering. We got to understand what to do when God is silent. Quit act, accusing God as soon as he gets silent. Examine yourself. Keep talking to God. Understand he's sovereign. The final point. Jesus got up, walked to the bow, and said, peace be still. Here is the part I did not get, but it's really the whole test of the miracle. They, did, they didn't understand they were saved when they had the Savior with them. They had seen him do miracles. They had walked with him. They had talked with him. They had been with him, but they didn't know they were saved. And I found out why as I was doing this test. I found out why. In Mark's gospel, chapter 1, the first verse says, Mark's gospel to show that Jesus was the Son of God. Mark's whole point was to show Jesus was the Son of God. But these disciples, because Jesus had to ask them these two questions, at the end of this, after them seeing the miracle, they saw him take over, he, could, he had dominion over demons, he had dominion over, over all sickness, he had dominion over crippled people, but they saw him now with dominion over nature. But I found out that the problem with the disciples, which you better never do, they did not know who he was. You say, Reverend, that's silly. No, it's not. Look at verse 41. It said, they looked at him in verse 41. And they said, they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this? The very winds. What manner? This is your savior. You're confusing him with somebody else. That was the whole problem. They didn't know they were saved because they didn't know they were with the savior. They didn't know they were with God. Jesus asleep is still God sleeping with you. Jesus asleep is still God who can make things happen because he has forethought. Jesus asleep is still God. Can I tell somebody something? Here goes a shouting point. You can start rejoicing right now because God already lined up your blessing. Even if he's sleeping, he lays stuff out for years to come. He looked down the road and knew what you were going to have. All you got to do is have enough courage to rise up and grab it and believe it and shake yourself and say, God is mine. I'm saved. The disciples were asked these two questions. The whole point of this miracle was to show Jesus is God. And if God got me in his arms, I'm saved. Let me tell you this as I close. Isn't that good? I said, wow. How do you eat with Jesus and walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus and be with Jesus and still not know who he is. This text letting us know it's impossible. Can I tell you, my brother and sister, maybe that's your problem. You got so used to it. You forgot he's God. You'd rather blame him than bless him. Just a preacher walking with his barber. And the barber was, he was witnessing to the barber. The barber was kind of he didn't, he didn't want to hear it. And he said, if God is so powerful, why are you letting all this suffering? Why are all these people dying? Why are all this virus going on? What's going on? And the minister didn't answer a word. They walked a little further. And they saw this man laying down, dirty clothes, and unkempt, unkept hair, beard out of place, hair shagging all over the place. He said, it's a shame. How are you a barber and letting people sit around, hang around on the streets by your barbershop looking like that? That's your fault. He said, how is that my fault? That man never came to me. If he came to me, I could make him look like a million bucks. And he said, that's God's problem. You can't blame God if folk don't come to him to get the blessing. The disciples couldn't get the blessing. Because they were sitting there with a teacher, but they didn't realize they were sitting with God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just for a minute, I feel the Spirit of God in here. Man, don't you ever let God 
ask you, have to ask you these two questions. After the way he blessed you, how come you're so fearful? And how is it you have no faith? But all you need is a mustard seed, and God can turn your life around. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord God, I believe you died for my sins. Since I believe it and confess it, I am saved. Jesus is Lord. If you prayed that prayer, your life just got turned around. Thank you for joining us today. Please check on our screen. If you want to give to our ministry, it's a powerful ministry. We're feeding people every month. We're helping runaway girls who got kicked out of their homes. We're blessing. We have an addiction program. Just check our website. We're doing things to make the kingdom of God a reality in this day. This Pastor Douglas saying, have a good day. Have a good day. Have a blessed day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down. But with a no way up And I needed some help Everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free